welcome you all to worship this morning. Um, I especially welcome, I see a new, few new faces. I see a couple of visitors. Um, I'm going to embarrass one of them. <laughs> Dale Graybell's sister, Diane Graybell Tarantelli. Did I say that right? She grew up in this church. She's lived in California for several years. And Dale and I switched as worship assistants for today because he told me his sister was going to be here, which I thought meant he wasn't going to be here. And he said to me today, I said, oh, Dale's here, and he brought his sister. And he said to me today, well, I wanted to sit with her. That's why I didn't, he didn't want to be up here. He wanted to sit with Diane. And she says she wouldn't know anybody. And I said, I know you, and I'm sure there's a few other people I know that know you that have been around. So welcome, and uh, let's just have a visitor, it looks like. My sister Diane, too. We have a lot of Diane's here. Okay. <laughs> welcome, Diane. Um, I want to bring your attention to the blue insert in your bulletin. This is the, well, this is the last Sunday we'll be collecting items uh, for the event for the mission committee. And we have collected quite a few things, and we thank you all for that. And this will be the last week for that. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the celebrations that's on the back of your bulletin. And so happy birthday and happy ver anniversary to the folks that are mentioned there. They're right this week as opposed to last week. <laughs> oh, Joan, you did it last week, Joan did it this week. Okay, thank you, Joan. Um, we are going to be uh, recognizing our graduates again. This will be the third take uh, as we've, we've got the, the last grandparent here uh, now who has recovered from COVID and is with us, so we will do that later in the service. Um, just so that you are aware that the replacement of the sidewalks front and back will begin on Monday. So you're gonna see a dumpster out there. You're gonna see some work. They're gonna start with the back, um, just so that you're aware of that. Uh, they expect to be done in about a week. And our Thrive by Five sessions are in recess from now until July 11th, so it won't interfere with any of that. At this time, I'm going to light our candles of remembrance and peace. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military, their families, the veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. And the candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's presence in our homes, community, the nation, and the world. Now, if you would rise as you were able, and please join me with our call to worship. Be gracious to us, O God, for to you we cry. We call on you in the midst of trouble. We know you will answer us. Gladden our souls, O Lord. We lift up our souls to you. Turn to us. Be gracious to us. Give us your strength. There is no one like you, for you alone are God. Let us join our hearts and voices to worship God. Our first hymn this morning is number 2001. We sing to you, O God, in the faith we sing hymnal in the pews. <coughs>
please join me in our opening prayer. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to see the wonder and beauty all around us when we pay attention and allow distractions to fall away. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, that we may find your abundant peace right in front of us, meeting our needs and filling the God-shaped empty spaces inside of us. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, in this time of worship, that we may be changed by our encounter with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. If you please stand for the Gloria. going to recognize our graduates for the third time, the third time to be the charm. Um, we had uh, three, um, and the last couple of weeks we have been recognizing uh, William Kaufner, a graduate lawyer from OCC, and also has a degree uh, from the National Tractor Trailer School with his ACLD license, and currently he's employed with Herc Rentals, um, carrying heavy equipment on a flatbed around the, around the state, and we're bringing it back. We've also honored in the past Nicholas Alexander Daly, and he graduated Thursday night from Liverpool High School, and he'll be serving in the Air National Guard, and he's been doing monthly dr drills there since last fall as an electronic warfare specialist. And he's the son of Craig and Tiffany Law, and the grandson of Dick and Diana. And we are really pleased today to recognize Colin Lawrence O'Donnell. And he is graduating from West Genesee High School. He will be attending the University of Cincinnati to study urban planning. He is the son of Larry and Sheila O'Donnell and the grandson of Joan and Dan O'Donnell. And as <coughs> Dale mentioned the first week, in the past we have given gifts, such as pens and cups. And uh, last year we started giving the graduates some, some money, <laughs> which we thought would be uh, more useful, and uh, they can spend it where they need to. So, Joan, um, if you would like to come up and take it for Colin. Thank you very much. I know he will appreciate that gift if he will. Our next hymn is number 506, Wellspring of Wisdom.
seated. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalms, <clears throat> excuse me, 86, verses 1 through 10 and 16 and 17. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of our people, and you pardoned all their sin. Am I in the wrong thing? Oh, I'm reading through 85. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's start over. <clears throat> this is Psalm 86. And verses 1 through 10 and 16 and 17. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For to you do I cry all day. Gladden the soul of your servant for you. O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O oh Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O oh Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. Oh, let me repeat that. Do wondrous things. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Our next reading is from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered around in the wilderness of Bathsheba. When the, when the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good, far, a good way off about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. This is the word of God among us. Did I miss a? You can go to verse 21. 
Oh. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> All right. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness, and he became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of God among us. And this is the word of God in scripture. And this is the word of God within us. Good morning. Friends, would you join your hearts together with mine in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our rock, our strength, our hope, and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we were talking about Sarah. We heard about Sarah's laughter and the complicated story of just why Sarah might have found God's plans so laughable. But I mentioned that Sarah... Uh, Sarai, before God gave her a new name, that Sarah also used her limited power to make life difficult sometimes for her slave woman, Hagar. And so today we're looking at things from Hagar's perspective, because hopefully, and hopefully unsurprisingly, God, lover of those on the underside, God is with Hagar, too, in her story, too, making promises to Hagar, too. As we heard last week, uh, when Sarah was not conceiving a child, she decided that she would take things into her own hands, and she gave her slave, Hagar, to Abraham, and through Hagar, uh, Hagar gave birth to a son, Abraham's heir, named Ishmael. Hagar's part of the story isn't a part that often gets a lot of attention because it's a bit uncomfortable. Hagar is enslaved, and she has no choice in what is happening to her, no option to give or withhold her consent. But what's unusual and what we can take as a blessing in this story is that we get to hear her story. We get to hear her story in, in some amount of depth, even though she is a woman, and even though she is an enslaved woman, and even though she is an Egyptian woman, not uh, one of the Hebrew women. We first meet Hagar uh, some chapters before we encounter her today in chapter 21. It's in chapter 16 that Sarah offers Hagar to Abraham in order to make sure that Abraham can have an heir. And her plan works, Sarah's plan works. But when Hagar becomes pregnant, the text tells us that Hagar looks with contempt on Sarah. Now, we don't know exactly why this is, whether Hagar is feeling proud because she has been able to conceive when Sarah, a free woman, has not, or whether she's hopeful that being the mother of Abraham's child will mean her own freedom from enslavement, or whether Hagar is just justifiably angry that she has to be a parent on terms that are not her own. At any rate, it seems that Hagar loses sight of the fact that the child that she's carrying, unfortunately, is not going to change her status as a slave at all. In response to Hagar's contempt, Sarah, 
with Abraham's blessing, starts to deal harshly with Hagar. Again, we don't know what this means specifically, but we do know that Sarah is the one with all of the power in this situation. And apparently things are bad enough that it drives Hagar to drastic action. And she runs away into the wilderness. Now, the direction she's running is right to maybe be heading back to Egypt, her homeland. But the distance is daunting. It's a few hundred miles, at least. And Hagar is everything that is vulnerable. She is a woman, a slave, pregnant, in a region where everyone else is of a different race, religion, accent, cultural tradition than she is. And going to the wilderness is heading into an extremely dangerous place. But suddenly for Hagar, it seems like the better choice than staying where she is. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I grew up with an image in my head of what wilderness is, and I always sort of pictured a, a wild, overgrown forest when I thought of wilderness. It tells, you know, where I grew up. <laughs> but wilderness in the Bible refers mostly to desert places, barren, dry, rocky places. But either way you're picturing it, a desert or a forest, the wilderness is a vulnerable place, risky and dangerous, especially when we find ourselves there alone or perhaps even lost. Now we can think back to uh, Jesus and the time of the beginning of his ministry when he spends time in the wilderness. Jesus goes there intentionally, compelled by the Holy Spirit to confront anything that would distract him from God's plan, God's plan to change the world through Jesus' life. He, Jesus enters the wilderness with open eyes and an open heart, and he goes ready to um, deepen his resolve for the path ahead of him to draw closer to God, the parent who has just named Jesus as beloved at his baptism. But Jesus, as usual, is the exception. It's pretty rare that biblical figures end up in the wilderness in quite the intentional, uh, purposeful, spiritual way that Jesus does. More often, they arrive in the wilderness because the dangerous wilderness suddenly seems like the lesser of two evils when it's compared with whatever desperate situation the person is encountering in their supposedly civilized world. And so Hagar runs to a place that is extremely dangerous for her, but she only goes there because it seems that the alternative is unbearable. She can't stand it anymore where she is, how she's been treated, the role that has been foisted on her. She can't do it anymore. And so she runs to a place that otherwise would seem anything but a place of refuge. But when Sarah, when Hagar gets to the wilderness, she's found by a messenger from God. Hagar tells the angel that she is running away, but God, through the angel, tells her that for now, for now, Hagar needs to go back to Sarah and deal with her. She's sent back to her life as a slave. Hard words to hear. But that's not all that the angel says. The angel says that Hagar, too, is part of God's promise. The same promise that God gave to Abraham, God gives to Hagar. Her offspring will be more than a multitude. The angel tells her to name her son Ishmael, which means God listens. Ishmael will be no ordinary man, the angel says. Things won't be easy for him, but in him, Hagar has a future. 
Freedom seems imminent. Hagar, an enslaved Egyptian woman, has a place in God's story. And then in a verse that really uh, touches my heart, Hagar names God. In chapter 16, verse 13, we read, So she named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Naming God, or naming, naming in the Bible is usually the other way around. It is God who names us. Or at least God might tell us what name to call God. But Hagar, Hagar is the only one, the only one who names, gives a name to God. She can't help but name the one who is saving her. El Roy, which means the God who sees me. Hagar knows that God has really seen her in the wilderness and when she was back with Sarah and Abraham, God really sees her, even her. And knowing that makes all the difference, and her life is changed. And that brings us to the second part of Hagar's story, which is the text that we heard Anne read today. Some years have passed now, and, and things have gotten better for Sarah, her laughter of doubt has turned into the laughter of rejoicing. She has a child, Isaac. And for a bit, Sarah is happy. And Hagar, she's managing at least. But eventually, Sarah sees Isaac, her son, and Ishmael, Hagar's son, playing together. And it's a scene that maybe strikes us as kind of sweet, these brothers playing together. But Sarah sees a threat, a threat to Isaac's future, a competitor, and a threat to her own future and stability. And something in her seems to snap, and she tells Abraham to send Hagar and Hagar's son away. She says, the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. Abraham is reluctant, but as before, he's somewhat passive in this story. God reveals that both Isaac and Ishmael, uh, in both of them, will God's promises be fulfilled. And so Abraham concedes, and with some food and water, Hagar is sent away. And again, again, she finds herself in the wilderness, this time even more vulnerable because she is with her young, vulnerable son. But God's messenger finds her again when she is at her most desperate, when she believes that she is going to have to watch her child starve to death. And the messenger says, do not be afraid. God has heard the voice of the boy. Come, lift the boy up and hold him fast, for I will make a great nation of him. And God opens her eyes to see a well of water in the wilderness, a sign of life and hope. And we read that Ishmael grows up in the wilderness. He becomes an expert with the bow, and God is with him. The wilderness, the very barren place that can be a source of danger and risk, is home for Ishmael, a place that brings life and future. Yes, God fulfills the promises made to Abraham and Sarah, but God has promises for Hagar, too, and is as faithful to those promises as the ones that drive the, the main story of the scripture. Sometimes I, I think that we can be a bit like Sarah in this story. 
My Uncle Bill told me that when he and my aunt were expecting their second oldest child, my Uncle Bill was filled with anxiety because he was sure he would never be able to love a second child as much as he loved the firstborn. But he talked with my grandfather who reassured him and Uncle Bill discovered that indeed his love would grow, would stretch, would multiply, rather than be divided among his children. Maybe you've experienced that love grows in the same way. Even though Sarah had just experienced the fulfillment of her wildest dreams, her deepest joy, what she had longed for for years, even though she had seen God's promises come true, it somehow still was not enough. She let herself be ruled by fear, and it was as though she was afraid that Someone else having joy meant that there would be less joy for her. That God's promises being fulfilled in Hagar would mean that somehow the promises that had been fulfilled for Sarah already would somehow be lost or ruined. Even though I believe we know better, I think sometimes when it comes to God, God's gifts for us, God's promises to us, God's love and grace in our lives, we end up nervous and afraid that blessings for someone else leave less for us, as if God needs to divide love among us, portion love out among us. Sarah has gotten all that she could barely even hope to receive. She has received it all. And somehow she lets her blessings, her promises, seem like she has been dealt a meager portion. But God is faithful. The God of Isaac and Ishmael. The God of Sarah and Hagar. And sometimes I think we are like Hagar, too. We find ourselves in the wilderness of life, feeling like we've ended up there because our only options are bad options, and the wilderness is the best of our choices, overwhelmed, alone, even sometimes abandoned by God and all who love us. But every time Hagar ends up in the wilderness, every time, she finds that God is there. And it gives her even the audacity, the boldness, the trust to name God, El Roy, the God who sees. Because God does see. And perhaps in the wilderness, we are better at seeing God in return, at having the, the space, the opportunity to make eye contact with God and realize that we are not alone. We serve the God who listens, the God who sees, who sees all that we are facing right now, who sees all that we have to confront in the wilderness, who sees all that we are running from, and who has a vision, the God who sees what might yet be for us, what we might yet be running towards. When have you been Sarah, trying to make God's promises fit your own plans, or worried maybe that God has less left for you because of the blessings another receives. When have you been Hagar, needing a reminder that God will see you and hear you and be faithful to you even when you feel hopeless and lost in the wilderness? 
blessedly. God is the God of Sarah and Hagar, with promises enough for both, for us, for all. Whatever side of the story we read, God is there. God sees. God is faithful. Thanks be to God. Amen. For those of you here this morning, you can leave your tithes and offerings in the basket in the narthex. And for those who are joining us on social media, please mail your offerings to 823 Franklin Park Drive, East Syracuse. If you will now stand for the technology, doxology, please. Oh, choir. Oh, choir. I'm sorry. Choir, I'm really screwing up today. <laughs> now we will enjoy <laughs> the choir's offertory for us. Thank you, choir. That's a song that many of us are familiar with and have been for quite a while. Now, if you will please stand for the doxology and our offertory prayer.
please join me with our offertory prayer. We offer to you these gifts, O God, our tithes and offerings that we have set aside for ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. Here in this church, in our community, and throughout the world. Open your eyes to the needs of others and how we might be attentive to them through sharing of our treasures, but also our time and talents. Amen. You may be seated. to come to you guys. I just want to say publicly a thank you to these fabulous people in front of you for sticking with us in the choir, for coming and singing, even when they're feeling sick or have a lot going on in their lives. They've been here every week, and I just want to say thank you to these people. Amen. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, choir. Um, does anyone else have some joys and concerns? Well, I want to thank everybody for the prayers for my mom. She passed away June 20th, and we had a service yesterday for her. She was one day shy of her 92nd birthday. So she was uh, suffering toward the end, so it, it was sort of a you know, blessing. Thank you. We're, we're praying for you and your family, Greg. What was your mom's name, Greg? Teresa. Anyone else have any joys? Uh, I took a few days off and went to Florida. Yay. The cats <laughs> took care of Bill. <laughs> uh, and I just had the joy of family and friends. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're back safe. You know. yeah. Anyone else have any joys or concerns that they would like to share this morning? Okay. I would just like to, I don't know if it's a joy or not, but this is the last Sunday that we'll be having a fellowship down in the fellowship for coffee and cookies or whatever in the fellowship hall. So come on down and enjoy us, and we will start up again in September. Thanks, Ann. Um, I would also lift up a joy that um, my mother um, went to her uh, 50th nursing school reunion this week and had a, a, wonderful, a wonderful time uh, celebrating with, with her friends. Uh, and also, just to, we celebrate the, those that are joining us for worship today and the abundance of Dianes, for which we give thanks, right? So many Dianes, we are thankful. Friends, let's join our hearts together in a time of prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for so many blessings that you have poured out into our lives. We are especially thankful for the opportunity to come together in worship, to have this place to uh, lift our voices in song, to hear the, the music of the choir, the joy that they share, the, their faithful commitment to, um, to sharing the gift of music with us under Christie's leadership. We give you thanks for being able to hear and study your word together, for being a place of fellowship where we build each other up in times of joy and in times of struggle. Oh God, we are blessed by the opportunity to be together in worship, and we ask, oh God, that you would fill our hearts, that you would remind us that you are the God who sees and the God who listens, and that you are so faithful to your promises to us, and that you are pouring out abundance with enough love and enough grace and enough promises to cover all of us. We give you thanks. Oh God, we lift up to you today the, the joys that we have encountered. We give thanks for Lynn and for her opportunity to go to Florida and spend time with family and friends and be rejuvenated after uh, all the struggles that she has endured. We give you thanks, God, and thanks for her, her safe return. Oh, God, we don't mind giving thanks for graduates for a few weeks in a row to lift them up uh, more than once because they are treasures and we are so proud of their accomplishments and we're thankful that, that Joan has recovered and is able to be here today as we give thanks for Colin and celebrate his accomplishments. 
Oh God, we give thanks for family and loved ones who are able to spend time with us, especially for Diane and Diane who are visiting today and for their uh, presence with us. We give you thanks, God, for uh, my mother Karen's uh, 50th uh, uh, reunion from nursing school and for the um, the hard work of, of nurses and, and health professionals everywhere and for the joy and, and celebration that they experienced at their reunion this week. Oh God, we even give you thanks as we think about a, a shift in the rhythms of, of coffee hour and the seasons of life, the rhythms of life, the, the times for rest and the times for activity. You are in the midst of it all, God. And God, since you are the God who sees and the God who listens, we know that we can lift up our hearts to you when we are in times of trouble, when our hearts are breaking, when we need your healing and comforting presence. Especially today, we lift up to you Teresa, Greg's mom, who passed away. Oh God, we... We ask that you would surround Greg and his whole family with your love and your comfort in a time of grieving. We know that Teresa was struggling, but still, God, we know of the pain and sorrow of loss. And so we pray for your comfort and your peace, even as you receive Teresa into your presence. Oh God, we share with you these prayers and the prayers that are on our hearts. We know that you hear, that you see, that you listen, and that you answer us with love, love, love enough for all. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the faith we sing, number 2146, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
This song could be Hagar's song, I think, and it's our song. Whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to sign, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. The God who sees, sees you and loves you and is faithful to you. Let us go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.